This video is for entertainment and educational purposes only. All right, guys, I'm back with Dr. Todd Lee, MD, uh, again today for another Q&A. How are you, how you doing, Todd? Doing good, doing good. Ready to face today. <laughs> face. So I had a smart ass ask me the last time, and I got to ask you this one in the comments section. He was like, is uh, Dr. Todd Lee a real doctor, or is he like a doctor like Dr. Tony Huge? I guess he didn't see the degrees hanging up in the background. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he basically shames an entire culture <laughs> by the antics of nonsense and the lie about what he is. I mean, he's like, well, I've got a Juris doctorate, so technically I'm a doctor. I'm like, yeah, but you're not supposed to actually refer to yourself as a doctor because it's ambiguous. It's that boy who cries wolf bullshit that makes everyone look like charlatans. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, Dr. Todd Lee is a real doctor, people. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the degree is hanging up right behind him. I've got a, a bachelor's, almost completed a master's, and then I've got a medical doctorate. So I technically, and it was a double major. So technically, I sort of have four degrees or two and two halves or whatever, two complete degrees and two incomplete degrees. Yeah, and here, here I am with a music degree and a computer science degree. <laughs> um, and I'm talking about this shit. I don't think, yeah, it's completely irrelevant. I mean, obviously they don't talk about anabolic pharmacology in med school. Otherwise, your doctor would be good at his job. It's just something you have to learn that surprisingly the bodybuilders are going to be the best in the world at this stuff. It's just that having an educated bodybuilder means that they're going to be able to read the material and understand it and assimilate it and know what the words mean and stuff. Yeah, that no. anybody can read a study, but that doesn't mean everyone understands the study equally. Reading comprehension yeah. involves having appropriate vocabulary. Yeah. You can't read if you don't know what the words mean, then reading it doesn't do a whole lot of good. I, it could be written in Arabic, and if I don't read Arabic, it doesn't matter if I read it or not. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you have to have the ability to comprehend what you're looking at, which most people don't. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, regardless, you know, even having a science background, I mean, we had to, it wasn't the same thing, but, you know, we had to do research and look at studies and, sh and shit when I was in school. Um, so, I mean, that definitely helps with things. Um all right, I got first question here from Sub Zero. This is one I get from people a lot. Uh, should I be worried about elevated red blood cell count, hemoglobin, hematocrit, et cetera? Or is that just the whole point of being on gear? And do doctors just panic about this stuff unnecessarily? All right, so the big concern is that there's this thing called correlation versus causation. Yeah. That in populations that have strokes that have thick blood they also happen to be prone to strokes and are old that in other words there's risk factors for strokes one of them could be thick blood but in the absence of all other risk factors that doesn't necessarily mean you will have thick blood i mean a stroke the person that i know has the best module about this is victor black he has it's like his master class it's basically he has a module on the erythrocytosis, which is elevated red cells. And he differentiates between polycythemia, vera, erythrocytosis, whether phlebotomy is an appropriate treatment and whether it's applicable to young athletes versus elderly people with already pre existing heart disease. And the gist of it is that it's not necessarily harmful to get phlebotomy or it could be harmful to get phlebotomy depending on certain circumstances, but there certainly is no benefit to it. And that you're right that most doctors, as usual, they know nothing about bodybuilding. They know nothing about anabolic pharmacology. They know nothing about how to read our blood work. They know nothing about how to treat us. And they treat all bodybuilders as if they're overweight men of their age. So if you're 240 pounds jacked, 240 pounds fat, your BMI is still the 37 that it is, 
they're going to treat you like you're obese. And even if you don't have high cholesterol, you don't have high blood pressure, and you have elevated red blood cell count, they're going to treat it as if you just have a different disease than you have, and they're going to treat it with the treatment they know, which is phlebotomy. And that's what everyone submits to their cowardice, and that is pervasive and ubiquitous, and that people assume that that standard of care is appropriate because it's standard. Just like how most people think that steroids are bad for your liver and your kidneys, and that is not true. It is basically, I mean, it is indirectly true, but the reason why they think that it is true is because they're looking at elevated ALT, AST, and creatinine, which are markers of muscle as well as liver or kidney. And that what you're really seeing is muscle trauma when you see elevated ALT, AST, and creatinine, not that your liver and kidneys are failing. Right. So those are the big things that doctors look at and overreact to is ALT, AST, creatinine, and um, what do you call it? Uh, The HCT or hematocrit or hemoglobin percentage. Does that mean that it's good to be elevated in those areas? No. I mean, but it doesn't, it isn't, indicative that you're going to have any problems either it's just that the doctor doesn't know how to read the blood work where, where is the cutoff for you on hematocrit where you, where you think you need to take take action so it's supposed to be 17.0 uh, i believe for one value and then the percentage one is 55 so 55. if you're at 16.8 and 54 you're safe by all metrics obviously if you've got you know, a calcium score that's through the roof, if you've got high blood pressure, if you happen to be overweight, if your face is purple, these are things that are concerning and maybe you should find gear that is less provocative to your red blood cell count. But if you are have everything going for you good, like I think mine's running the line of 17 and 55 a lot of the time, and I'm not concerned about it. My doctor's not concerned about it. And he's conservative, but, you know, I've helped him understand a lot of different things about the ALT, the AST. For example, he didn't know what anabolic steroids were. He thought anabolic steroids were synonymous with testosterone. And I couldn't get it through to him that, like, I don't, I, well, at the time I wasn't taking testosterone. I was taking nandrolone. And he didn't understand what nandrolone was. So we did the blood test and he wanted to touch my testosterone. I'm like, I'm not going to have any testosterone. And he thought I didn't understand what I was talking about. And then he's like, wow, you really don't have any testosterone. I think I had like a two, not 200, <laughs> and two, you know, <laughs> and like everything was perfect. And he's like, wow, you pretty much disproved all of medical science that there is a safe way to do steroids. He's like, he was really impressed. <laughs> he's like, you did it. Wow, that's crazy. And then he just listens and orders what I want him to order, and we discuss it so that we're on the same page because there's some things that he knows that I don't know. It's just cool to have a doctor who's willing to accept that there's some things you know that they don't know. Yeah, I've, I've been having a hard time finding that doctor. <laughs> My, mine actually fired me. He told me he wasn't going to treat me anymore until I stopped. Uh and I was paying for an expensive ass concierge doctor. And I was like, all right, dude. Well, it's just the irony is they can't just, to me, because I'm a doctor, they admit, like, I just don't understand. That with a normal patient, they're not going to be like, I don't understand. I'm in and over my head. I'm confused. And it's embarrassing. You know what I mean? They're not going to say that to a regular person. But if you're another doctor, they can just say, well, you know more about this than me. Yeah, I mean, he just told me he didn't feel ethically <laughs> that it was right to treat me. Uh, I, I came clean. I told him what I was doing, and then he he freaked out. So I, was like, I don't know. I mean, when they say that, that's just they're out because really it's yeah. their ego that's bruised. Because yeah. if they knew what they were doing, they wouldn't give a fuck about the rules. They would be like, oh, I, I know more than all the other doctors. I'm going to do what I want. But when they don't actually know more than the other doctors, they hide behind the ethics shit. Like, I'm not supposed to do this. It's wrong. It's only more when it's convenient. And it's only convenient when it actually protects their ego. I'm like, look, dude, I just want a fucking ACE inhibitor. (laughs) That's all. That's it, man. I'm not I'm not asking you to prescribe me (laughs) painkillers. Yeah, it was like he was like trying to get I was like, I've got gyno. So I want some tamoxifen. He's like, well, 
that's going to damage your, it's going to give you osteoporosis. Like I'm squatting 500 pounds, not going to get osteoporosis. <laughs> <laughs> and he's just like, well, I mean, I just don't feel comfortable treating for that. I mean, it could cause blood clots and stroke. I'm like, it's not going to give me a stroke, man. I've been using it for 10 years. Every time this problem pops up, I use it for four or five days and then I'm off of it. That it's, it's specific surgical treatment of the problem with the appropriate chemotherapy for the offending thing. And I was like, I can just get it underground and shipped over here as normal, but I figured since you're so concerned about my health, you'd want me to use the prescription pharma grade stuff and not something that someone made in their basement. But if you think <laughs> it's safer for me to use the stuff in my basement than to use the stuff from your pharmacy, then that's fine. You know, you know, back on the hemoglobin thing, I did, I did sort of a self experiment. I uh, I bought a hemoglobin med- meter, which, by the way, you can't get anymore. So I think you have to have a. Yeah, you, you you can't buy them anymore. I, I was told that they're they were banned by the FDA unless you have a medical need for them. Um, but I, I have a hemoglobin meter, and I was checked. I started checking my my uh, hemoglobin, and I and I noticed that. Uh, and I think some guys might be getting false readings in the morning because I, I noticed in the morning mine's higher, and then when I'm hi- hydrated, yeah. Yeah, it's like then people don't do that. They don't check their fasting blood glucose after drinking two liters of water and waiting an hour. They take their fasting blood glucose. It's like, oh my god, it's a one twenty. <clears throat> it's like it's not a fucking one twenty, man. Yeah, you're dehydrated. <laughs> you go to bed at a hundred. You wake up at one twenty. Your smogi effect was not that dramatic. It's yeah. because you're dehydrated. Yeah. All right. Uh, next question I got here. Nomad, or yeah, yeah, Nomad named Preston. Uh, could you stay on a low dose Primo and TRT indefinitely? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't see why not. I mean, as as you- assuming you do not have a problem, your blood work does not indicate a problem, then I see no reason why over time your blood work just going to shit. So, like, let's give some numbers to this. Like, if you're at a 100, and if you're doing 20 milligrams of test per day, so you're at 140 a week, you'll probably get better results than if you did 250 once a week. You probably have a higher testosterone and a lower estrogen. If you microdose daily rather than doing a blast once every seven days, despite what the pharmaceutical company and bad doctors will tell you, that having more frequent injections will give you more stable values. Um, and then if you were to add Primo to that, it would then theoretically, and me and probably in other people inhibit the conversion to estrogen. So you'd get even lower estrogen. So you might have to go up on the testosterone a little bit. So if 140 is your sweet spot, you might have to do 210, 30 a day of the test to balance out 20 a day of Primo or whatever it end up being. So if, for example, I running, if I'm running 60 a day a test, I have an 84 estradiol with no problems. If I wanted to go higher than that to hit that 500 to 600 sweet spot that you get most, your most efficient use of anabolics is at that total gear load of 600. I could probably run 500, basically 70 a day test and run maybe 30 a day primo. And that would put me at like a 700. And that would probably be about the same estradiol level as if I was running 60 a day test. Now you're talking about using HRT with Primo. And I think the flaw in the system would be people would use more Primo than they would use the HRT, which would make them too dry. And that they want to have their estrogen between that 20 to 40 range, maybe even higher if they can tolerate it without having gyno. So for that reason, because the drug you picked primo is um suppressive to estrogen conversion your test level might have to be above what would be normal for hrt for you so first i would receptor map out where the upper limit of your estrogen is that you're basically side effect free for me i can get as high as 400 test and then you can add in primo which will then dry it out 
And then you might find that 400, 200 is a good blend for you. Or if you're sensitive, 300, 150. But I don't think it's going to be the inverse. I don't think you're going to be able to run 200 tests and 300 primo. You're probably going to be too dry. I had a guy last on the after the last episode that was saying that there's studies are showing that Primo doesn't actually uh, lower estrogen. I, I've seen people say that before, but I I've seen it on blood work over and over and over again. It does 100. percent I mean, if Masteron does, and people know Masteron does, and Masteron is used for that purpose, and Primo is almost identical to Masteron, I don't see why it wouldn't. Right. And well, furthermore, all the experts say it does. So it's like, and I, my personal experience is playing with those values. I can adjust my estrogen just like dials on a guitar amp and almost fine tune it within 10% accuracy by, from pers from past experience, when I use X and Y value, I get Z estradiol. I can recreate that within 90% accuracy months to years later. Yeah, I mean, so clearly it works. I mean, I don't care what the fucking study says. I've seen it on blood work over and over and over again. I mean, studies are for, you know, based on the methods used and the population tested, what are the results? Like, oh, are they testing breast cancer women? Because that's who these drugs were designed right, for. Probably. They're not combination polytherapy with people who are anabolic steroid users who have a BMI over 35 with a testosterone base and using Primo in the presence of GH. You know, are those the populated you're testing? If you're not testing the population that you are a part of, then it is not a valid study at all. Yeah, most, most, most of these studies don't even apply to our cohort. Right. And that's the correct term, too, is cohort. It's like that the only in studies I'm interested in are the ones that are on bodybuilders that are intermediate or higher that have over 200 pounds of body mass who also are running polypharmacy, that they have to have test and a DHT, possibly an angelone and GH. And then if that's our study group, then I'm interested in what the results are. Yeah, this is a completely sidetracked thing, but did you see that one? Uh, it was, I think it's called the Harlem study where they, they, uh, this is a random one, but I wanted to ask you about it, where they took a hundred bodybuilders and had half of them come off or had all of them come off and half of them do PCT and the other not, not do PCT. And they had the exact same testosterone levels after six months. Like the PCT. Oh, I believe it's six months for sure. That doesn't surprise me. I think the point of the PCT is to return you to a closer approximation of your six month value sooner, sooner rather than yeah. it taking six months. It might take three months. Yeah. Yeah. I just thought, I thought that was fascinating that, you know, kind of blew some of the preconception. I mean, really it, it showed, it showed like, I think they did a, uh, it was a 30, 60, 90 and 120 day follow up, And it, you could see it, the initial, like the in, in the first sixty days, there was definitely better recovery, but it, it seemed to balance out over the long term. So that that whole thing about long term shutdown seemed to be just kind of at least well, in this. When I got started, they would say that kind of stuff. Like if you use steroids, your testicles will shut off and they'll never turn back on. And I, any doctor I ever talked to, because back in the day, this was the, the internet wasn't as sophisticated. It's like, have you ever seen that happen? They're like, no. I'm like, is there a mechanism that would indicate this would happen? Like, why? They're like, sometimes it just doesn't. I was like, so sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't, but there's no reason to know what differentiates between group A and group B. And they're like, yeah. And I was like, I'm thinking like, it sounds like bullshit. It sounds like they just don't know. They're just repeating a fear. Yeah. Like if you sneeze, evil spirits go up your nose. Well, how come? Well, because that's what my priest told me. And then you ask that priest, and it's like, well, that's what the Vatican told me. And then you go to the Vatican, and they're like, that's what the previous cardinal told me. And then it's like, well, that cardinal's dead, but here it is from a different cardinal who's also dead. It's like, doesn't make it true just because it comes from high authority, right? Yeah, I thought I thought that one was I thought that one was fascinating. Um, all right, uh, next one I've got from the church to the street. Uh, he said, can you talk about HGH timing? Uh, what about that pre and post HGH, uh, thing where you take a pre and post workout? Is that garbage? 
Are we talking about HGH? Okay, I thought for some reason you were talking about HGG because we were talking about p- post cycle therapy. No, no, um, no, HGH. Sorry. All right, it's not garbage, but okay. So this is an interesting thing. Is like you're supposed to do the GH post workout, right? Because that's when you want the most anabolism, but it's not going to peak for an hour to two hours. So the the concept is if you were to take a pre workout. It hits mid or end of the workout or post workout. So taking a pre workout subcutaneously would be like taking an intravenously post workout. Furthermore, you want to resensitize the GH receptors with the presence of insulin, which can be achieved not necessarily with exogenous insulin, but with carbohydrates. So basically, there's four windows I think of for taking your GH before bed which yes, it's suppressive, but that's when your binding proteins are released. So you get more out of the GH at nighttime when you're sleeping, regardless of if it suppresses the release of the endogenous amount. So if you naturally release a half a unit every night and you take two units, oh, that's wasting it. It's like, not really, because you're getting four times the load and you're getting more efficacy for that load. And then the next best time is first thing in the morning, you take it on an empty, and it's going to um, help with nutrition, nutrient partitioning throughout the day. And then the best second best time for anabolism is post-training. But if you take it post-training, when does it actually hit? It hits two hours later. So that's not necessarily hitting post-training. If you're trying to hit the bloodstream post-training, you'd have to take it pretty much pre-training or intra-training and then it hits post-training and then in theory the intra-workout carbs would have resensitized the gh receptors because that's when the insulin was taken i mean the insulin was released because the carbs are taken intra-workout so that doesn't really answer his question i mean it's not bullshit but because of You don't know what they really mean when they say post-workout. Do they mean in the bloodstream post-workout or do they mean into the subcutaneous fat post-workout or do they mean into the muscle post-workout? Because all of them have different areas under the curve. All of them have different time of onset. So the most cost-efficient way to use the GH is subcutaneous, but it takes two to two and a half hours to hit the bloodstream. And then it it lasts for seven hours. If you do it intramuscular, it takes like an hour to 90 minutes to hit the bloodstream, and it lasts for like five hours. If you do it intravenous, it's instantaneously in your bloodstream, and then it's flash is out and 30 minutes. What's going to generate the greatest IGF-1? And then what's going to create the greatest localized IGF-1? Well, intramuscular. You're not going to get intramuscular IGF-1 from intravenous administration or subcutaneous administration of the same effect you just get systemic igf1 but if you're trying to get an intramuscular igf1 load then it would be like okay i'm going to train shoulders in theory you would do gh bilaterally pre-training in the shoulders so that post training that's when it's really active and it was you got the localized effect then you get the systemic effect then it gets because of the increased blood flow from the pump you get a re activation of the localized effect because the shoulders epithelia is more porous the capillaries are more dilated in the tissue you just trained or are training so like even if you were to use a pre anabolic like people who use test base like i'm going to use test base in my triceps before i do triceps that doesn't mean that it works where it is because it's there it's that you pump up the triceps blood flows to the triceps the um the endothelia on the capillary bed dilates more allowing more exchange so you suck the test base into the bloodstream in the triceps because you're getting a pump in those triceps and you're working those triceps then it goes through your whole body through your heart and then back to your triceps again because that's what you're pumping up so injecting it in the triceps it's weird because it has to get into the bloodstream travel through the whole body go back to the triceps but it's more likely to go to those triceps than anywhere else because that's what you're pumping up with your high rep sets that's cool that's really cool i didn't know all that that's that's a new one for me well let's hope i'm right 
<laughs> I, I believe what I'm saying is true, but that's happened before. And then, you know, science says this study done on these elderly women in Zimbabwe was that blah, 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 blah. You could take all of this gear and nothing makes your penis bigger. And it's like, but they don't have a penis. They're women. You know, it's like. <laughs> I'm lazy. I just take it a post workout. <laughs> I get home. I do all my shots when I get home from the gym, <laughs> unless I'm doing insulin. You know, then I'll take a pre workout. But <laughs> yeah, so I guess my I'm the opposite. I do. Let's see. I will do three shots a day, and it depends on when I'm lifting. But usually, it's first thing in the morning. I'll do my GH before bed. I do GH, and depends on when I'm actually going to the gym. If I take it pre or post, because to me, it's more important that the shots are five to seven hours apart than it is that they are in relationship to a, the particular body part trained. But it's in the body part I was training that day for the most part, or a weak body part that's still sore from the previous day, like. If this block, I'm working delts and triceps and biceps and legs as being target areas. I'm not going to inject my legs because I don't want to fuck up the skin on my legs. I'm not going to inject my biceps because they get way too debilitated by injections. But triceps and delts are pretty durable for me. So every day is either the day of or the day after slash before a tricep and delt day because I hit those three times a week. So therefore, I just do delts and triceps pre or post training every day. Yeah, I, I usually do. I, I'll do an AM and PM shot. I just, I don't know. I, I haven't gotten that detailed with it. Uh, I mean, it's worked for me. Right, and that's the thing is a lot of people, a lot of the questions you're going to get on the internet are super duper specific. That And it's like, okay, we're going to do an extra four times the effort for a 1% difference in result. Yeah. And it's like, why, why not take that effort and allocate it towards something else in life that's more important? Like um, sleeping an extra 30 minutes or getting an extra set, putting an extra second on every rep so that you have a three second negative rather than a two second negative. Like that's more efficient and effective than all the gear in the world changes. Okay. You know, you could use 500 tests and 200 Primo and do your training and diet right and get a hundred times better results than the most complicated cycle ever and using the wrong training and the wrong diet. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's focusing on the stuff that matters. I mean, People get hung up on, it's like, I think we were talking about last week, people get hung up on the 5% when they don't have the 95% buttoned up. Yeah, that's a much better way of putting it, yeah. I mean, I I, I don't know. I, I try to focus on the low-hanging fruit first, like get my diet nailed, <laughs> doing training, training correctly. It is important to have a theory, though, because it's yeah. like, from this dude's perspective, it's like, look, I'm going to be doing this shot. When do I take it? simple yeah. question so like knowing you know it's like does it matter if it's pre or post and then it's like not really i guess would be the simplest answer because it's hitting your bloodstream either two hours to one 90 minutes to 150 minutes after you do the shot so depending on where you do the shot and how long the workout is it determines which is better whether it's subcutaneous pre long training session or intravenous post short training session now we're talking a big difference but if it's subcutaneous pre-training or post-training then the difference is only at two hours it means it's hitting your bloodstream either immediately post-workout or two hours post-workout which shouldn't make a difference okay that makes sense all right next one i got is from pavel pacchio i think is how you say his name i, I, I probably i apologize if i got that wrong um uh, who's your current favorite pro bodybuilder and who do you think is the next great thing? Who's going to win the Olympia in the future? Who's up and coming? I'll let you go. What do you think, Paul? I, I mean, my a feelings about those. I mean, my favorite bodybuilder, I, I like the thinking guys. I like John Jewett. I, I, lo I love John Jewett because he's just intelligent and, and, you know, it seems like he does things the smart way. He's probably my, my, just right now, favorite current bodybuilder. My favorite all time is uh, Dorian. I mean, who doesn't love Dorian just because of his work ethic? Um, and and up and coming guys. I, I don't know. I mean, I like Hunter Labrada a lot. 
Um, I like his physique. Um, Nick Walker is another one. But I don't know. Something about Nick Walker, I don't know. His physique just looks a little weird to me. I, I don't know. I don't know if he has potential to be a Mr. Olympia or not. Um, I, I, I like Labrada's physique overall better. So the way I interpreted that question was, who's your favorite bodybuilder from the perspective of as the athlete? Yep. So that um, even though John Jewett is his own coach, and that is a relevant point, I'm going to narrow this question down to as if you're asking about who is my favorite competitive bodybuilder currently as they are evaluated from a judge's perspective. That's a fair, that's a fair, yeah. fair enough question. So as evaluating their athletic bodybuilding stat status and only people who are like, for instance, of the people doing the Olympia this year, I'm going to narrow it down even further. So of the people that are doing the Olympia this year, who are my favorite versus who should win? I'm going to say that the question is favorite, not who should win. So I'm not saying who the best bodybuilder is. I'm not saying who's going to be the most successful, who's got the most competitive physique. It's whose physique do I like the most? And people are going to get pissed, but I'm going to say Terrence Ruffin. Because even though he's not an open bodybuilder, he is my favorite bodybuilder in the sense that he is more entertaining. When I go to the Arnold, it's to see Terrence's routine. It's not to see who wins. Right. Because to me, the person who has the best routine should be the winner. And that posing should be part of it. That charisma, stage presentation, all should factor in to who is the best bodybuilder, not just who has the best biceps, who has the front double by. You know, it's not a collection of body parts. It's not who has the best poses. It's overall who is the most impressive person, who is the most captivating performer that day. And that, to me, would always be Terrence. And Sam Sandauda gave Terrence a run for his money at the Arnold. And Samson's a phenomenal poser. Um, and he's also got pretty much Terrence's symmetry. He's just more massive, which if you can use massive in a symmetrical way, if you can balance that mass out, it's still going to always be more impressive. But Terrence was coming in at 173 soaking wet with full clothes on. And he, you know, he could basically come in 12 pounds heavier he's so under his cut off with clothes on that he has so much more room to put on muscle and he looks so much bigger now that he's over 200 pounds. So I think he's going to come in at like 180, 178 this year. He's he probably put on his five to 10 pounds of mass in all the right places. So Terrence is quickly going to, you know, I think that Sebum is going to have a run for his money from Urs and from Terrence. Now, I'm sure what he meant was open, who's my favorite open class. And we've got Derek is going into the open. We've got Sean, who's probably going to compete as open from the 212. We've got um, Nick has brought his waist in more. He's gained more mass. He's going to have better conditioning. And he's made his waist even better. So this is a way improved Nick Walker. Hunter got bigger. I don't know that Hunter's symmetry can handle the extra mass. Ian brought everything up else up to match his glutes if he brings a texas level of conditioning it's gonna be the best ian we've ever seen um bonac got his gyno fixed and added 20 pounds of muscle so he used to be competing at 225 he's going to be competing at probably 245 250 he might be the best he's ever looked brandon continues to bring his legs up to match his upper body and he's probably going to come in drier and this is the best big rami we've ever seen and Hadi added mass. Like literally every complaint or critique someone could have had the last two years about everyone in the top 10, they've all improved on those things. That this is easily going to be the best Olympia of all time. And it's funny because on Fuad's show, they were talking about the greatest um, Arnold Classic winners of all time. And they're showing footage of like Evan versus Branch versus Dennis Wolf and like all these comparisons and Kevin Lavrone, and then some and people are like, wait a minute, Nick's right here. And Nick's like, yeah, I wasn't going to say anything. But yeah, I did win the Arnold last year. And they're like, yeah, but Nick, you're not in the same league as like Branch Warren. And they pull up the video and they're like, what the fuck? Because they had forgotten. 
It's like when you compared Nick's look at the 2021 Arnold Classic versus like the other great Arnold Classic winners of the past, Nick fucking murders them. So people are like, oh, it was so much better in the 90s. You don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Those people from the 90s that say that, they're out of their fucking minds. Because that 1995 VHS recordings are so sharp that it details out the veins and makes people look like they're more conditioned than they were. But their glutes and their hamstrings are smooth as a baby's butt. None of those guys had good glutes or hamstrings. So they really weren't that conditioned. They were just dry from using Lasix, injectable Lasix. Furthermore, Kevin Lavone, who came back to the stage in 2016, said people talk about how we were better. They have no idea what they're talking about. I was standing backstage with those guys. They are so much bigger than we ever were. Yeah. They're just full. I'm old enough. I'm old enough to have seen some of those shows in person back then. Yeah, guys are way bigger now. They're bigger, and they're not using injectable Lasix. They're using a quarter of a diazide. So they're not as dry, but they're leaner, more conditioned, and they're fuller. Yeah. So it's bullshit that the people in the 90s were better. Fuck that. That is nonsense. They might look more symmetrical because they're smaller. But you gave uh, Nick Walker and put him up against Dorian, I'm pretty sure Nick Walker would beat Dorian. And people are like, oh, that's sacrilege. Who the fuck do you think you are? I'm like, someone who's been to the shows who has eyes. If you took Big Rami and put him up against Dorian, he probably could have beat him too. Now, Ronnie is a different story. I'm not saying anyone could beat Ronnie. But I think if you were to take all these people who took everything Dorian taught and then with better genetics and put them against Dorian, I think if we took Dorian of the 95 or 92 and put him against Nick Walker this year or Big Rami this year, I think that they might actually be able to beat the old Dorian. Well, what was, Dorian, right. what was Dorian on stage? He was like 260, right? At, yeah, at, I mean, he's yeah, nowhere yeah. near what Rami is at 280. Yeah, same uh, Rami's got 20 pounds of muscle on him. And at 2020 Olympia, he was as lean. And he looks better now than he's ever looked. I, I saw, I don't know if you saw Rami's post, or I think it was Dennis James that's working with him. Uh, it had a post up a couple weeks ago uh, of Rami, and he was 339, 10 weeks out. Yeah. <laughs> It's just it's incredible. <laughs> he, 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 I mean, he, his conditioning was great. I mean, yeah, so he's he, right. yeah, he's he, going to be even bigger this year. Maybe it, I don't know. It is, that's what I mean. Is like he's going to retire after this year, probably because he doesn't like it. But it's so it's so weird to me that people who are that talented care so little about the sport. And it's like I just don't get it. Like you know, he didn't train for six months last year. And the year before that, he was like trapped in the wrong country for six months. So this is the first year in many years that he's had the support network of Chad and Dennis. And everyone supports him in all of the Middle East, the Egypt specifically. He's a superstar there, like um, Michael Jordan, a bodybuilding in the Middle East. Yeah. And he's trying the whole year. And this is what he's capable of. He's pretty young too. He's only like forty or maybe thirty-five or something like that. So yeah, I think he's in his thirties, man. Yeah, I mean, there's no reason to stop anytime soon. So I don't get that. It's like it's not enough money for you. It's half a million dollars, and it explodes into all your other business avenues. So yeah. I disagree with this concept of retiring prematurely. I don't know why anyone would do that. And I, I, I don't know if it was true or not, but I had somebody through the grapevine tell that that knows Chad tell me what what he was what he had him on, and it was not nearly as much as what you would think. I bet he's at a thousand test. He's probably at fifteen hundred primo. He's probably at two to three hundred trend. He probably isn't even on orals yet. He's probably on eight units of GH. Yeah, the the. I gotta be careful what I say. Uh, uh, the the what I saw was was test EQ and Primo is what he was okay. running. Okay, so it's and, probably a thousand eight hundred, six hundred, or something like that. Yeah, and I think ten units of GH is what I was told. 
Yeah, so very reasonable doses. Yep. Yeah, and that was pretty much what he ran all, all year. So, so it's not like, what... like a Michigan bikini girl. What she <laughs> run? What? <laughs> it's not what people think, you know. Uh, that's that's what uh, I, I heard Chad Nichols said that everybody thinks he takes like these crazy crazy high doses of stuff, and he's not. And then you know, people are like, "That's still really high." I'm like, "Matt, for three thirty, I mean, no, because no, that's what's three thirty? It's one hundred and fifty kilograms." 150 yeah. kilograms at 15 milligrams per kilogram is what 2.25 grams. So if he was at a thousand eight hundred six hundred, that's 2.4 grams. Yeah. So it's he'd be at like 16 milligrams per kilogram. That's not a lot. No. No. All right. Next question I got here for you. Um, same dude. Um, <laughs> he I, I, he had some good questions. Uh, what do you guys think about Milo Sarchev's uh, hyperemia theory and his insulin protocols? Isn't he working with Samson? I think that's, yeah. yeah. I mean, Milos has been the standard for like 30 years. You know, Milos is kind of the origin story of, I think, where Justin would have gotten his protocols from. Probably. And it's. I used to think Milos' stuff is a little too extreme. But if you scale it down to a more reasonable dose, it's not any different than what I would have been doing for a while. It's the stuff that, you know, Karina and I have clients on for the most part. The, she actually went through and looked at it again with a fine tooth comb and found that it's, she agrees with it almost 100%. I don't like putting the leucine in the pre-workout, and I don't like mixing the glutamine with the arginine. I think that they compete with the receptor but I guess there isn't really good science to support that rumor. So there's just, to me, it's like, I would rather do HMB on the front end if you're in a deficit, but you don't need the leucine on the front end if you're not in a deficit, especially if you're going to have the leucine intra-workout. I would, I'm more of a leucine post-workout guy. I'd rather do it a simpler way rather than flush the system with an identical pre-workout, intra-workout, and post-workout. But I think this guy's talking about the carbs and the insulin. Yeah, And, uh, you know, the idea of using 10 units of insulin with 100 carbs, that to me is very dangerous. But you got to understand, Milos would make their drinks for them and train them. So he's there to observe them and pull the plug on their workout or fix the problem if they start tanking. I think that for someone who's not a doctor and not experienced to administer that much Humalog, and work, do these giant sets with carbohydrates by themselves, they're going to basically find themselves either excessive <coughs> loading and thus they'll get fat accumulation or they're going to go hypoglycemic. So I think for Milos to do it in person is reasonable because it's fine tuned for the individual to take a Milos protocol for Regan Grimes, scale it down to your body weight and administer it to yourself without any type of safety net, then you're fucked. I mean, all the guys I've seen do it just get fat. <laughs> right. And it's because they're not working out as hard as they would no. if Mubos was training them. It's to get you through a brutal ass workout. It's not you take a shit ton of insulin because you're taking a shit ton of carbs and then you try to work it off. It's the other way around. You have an incredible amount of volume you need to actually respond at this point. So you're taking in all these carbs to be able to get through the training. And then in order to force the carbs into insulin resistant tissue from the GH, you have to use that much insulin that they're doing it completely backwards. They're starting with, they see the insulin dose, then they're trying to supplement with carbs to be able to survive right. the insulin dose. And then they're throwing in the working out at the end. Yeah. They're matching the carbs to the insulin, not the other way around. Right. Yeah. And I, and I'm, I, I tell you the training um, I've tried it both ways. I used to train more kind of a hit style training and the insulin didn't do shit when I was doing hit hit style trading. Uh, it wasn't until I started doing volumes when when I started exploding with the, with the insulin. You, you gotta you gotta train with volume, I think, for the insulin to work right. And that's where I'm at. Is we talked about this last time. Is that my resting glucose the other day was 81, 
So I'm not using insulin because it's I don't need it. Even at right. six units of GH, I only have a 81 fasting glucose. Once I'm hydrated, it's like 95 if I'm not hydrated. I don't need to supplement with insulins because I'm insulin sensitive. And my intra-workout carbs are between 30 to 60. And my total carbs for the day is only 600. So I and my volume is pretty fucking high. I'm not going to turn up my volume just so I can justify using more carbs so that I thus need to use insulin because I'm responding good. If I was to turn up my volume, then my fatigue level would go up and I wouldn't recover for the next workout. How much but, total volume you hit in a week? I think week four was 250 sets. Okay. Of the programming, I think it went 150, 190. I mean, two, how many per? How many two. you hitting per body part? It well, so like for example, I hit eight sets of middle delts three times a week. Okay, so twenty four. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like rear delts, I'm hitting eight sets three times a week. Triceps week one is I think six. Week two is seven. Week three is eight. Week four is nine. Three times a week. Yeah, so, so you're doing you're doing like an RP style program, like I'm it's doing. It's exactly where an RP program. I like basically, yeah. yeah, it's more RP than RP. If you go look at the actual pre-made RP programs, it doesn't follow the principles as closely as. Yeah, I, I know. I threw the program. <laughs> I threw the spreadsheet I had in trash and just built it off of what was in the book, and it, it's it's the way I did it, you know. So yeah, I, I did the I did the exact same thing. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'll do like a five to six week block and I'll ratchet up the, the volume. And then I'll, I'll use a little more insulin as the volume goes up and a little more food. Um, but, um, yeah, I, th I, I found for me, like, I guess at my, somewhere between 20 and 25 total sets per body part a week is where I tap out. That's about the max I can go. Yeah. I mean, it's supposed to be per day up to 10. Yeah. So if you're doing back twice a week, then you can hit up to ten sets twice, so twenty sets. Yeah, yeah. Some some other like arms, I seem to be able to beat the fuck out of. I can I can put more in, and like I notice like hamstrings, I can't do as much. Uh, and same thing with quads, I I I can't get away with as much. My, so, my quad volume sucks because my quads take so long to recover. It takes like four or five days to recover for quads. Yeah, the hamstrings are supposed to recover slow, but my hamstrings recover pretty quick. Because I'm doing a very good SFR. Like, I like the seated leg curl, and I'll do that two, three times a week for from two to four sets, and they recover great. Yes, yeah, so I, I, it's, it's different from different body parts. Like, I mean, arms, I could easily do 25 sets a week, no problem. So, I found that with the arms, is I can do it, but am I going to respond? So yeah. there's a certain point where I'm doing more volume for arms and they're getting smaller, not bigger, without them feeling any more sore and without the performance decreasing. I've had, the the I've, had the with, I've had the opposite with my arms. I had a hard time getting my arms to grow. I think I was just lifting too heavy and not doing enough volume. Right. Before. I found that for triceps, I respond to 12 to 15 really well. Yeah. And for Same. bicep, surprisingly, it's more like 15 to 20 is where I respond for bicep. Yeah, I, it's the exact same thing with me, man. That's exactly where I, I, I landed with, with both. I, I used to do like 8 to 10 reps, and I didn't do shit. It hurts your joints, your wrists. Yeah, I just ended up with elbow tendonitis. <laughs> That's it. And everyone says that, and then they still go in there, and they just do the same thing, and they don't want to use light-ass weight. And it's like, dude, if you use light-ass weight, you get the best pumps. And the pumps are an indicator of the magnitude of the stimulus that you would, you know. So a phenomenal pump means you stimulated that muscle phenomenally. A minuscule pump means you minusculely stimulated that muscle. You traumatized your joints and tendons, but you minusculely stimulated that muscle to grow. And I mean, my own stimulate the muscle, not to traumatize the muscle right. or the joints. My elbows were stimulate, not annihilate, right? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah my elbows were constantly fucked with the old you know dc style training that i used to do my elbows were just constantly beat up it's so weird that everyone is so married to that dc training for so long and like none of these dc heroes had arms yeah like dorian's worst body part was his arms 
And that's what he tore. He had to retire from tearing his arms. Yep. I don't know. I've had be- I've had better results this way. Uh, let's see. I got time for about one more. Um, we would pick a good one out here. Um, this is one I've seen a lot lately. Uh, I've seen a lot of guys get concerned about low SHBG. Here's from Tom McGivern. He asked, uh, how about the importance of SHBG and how do I get it back up if it's low? You know, I found that I've never considered that it was of any value. And I had someone reach out to me yesterday to tell me about SHBG and that he got his from a two to a 20 and he stopped having plateaus in the gym. And we were having a discussion about it and I had to start my workout. So I didn't complete that discussion. I should reach out to him again and apologize that I didn't finish the conversation. Um, I don't really know what the value of SHBG is aside from that it's a reservoir of sex hormones. So if you're, my understanding is, although uh, Proviron is good at mopping up SHBG or Sting Metal is good at mopping up SHBG, even Masteron's good at mopping up SHBG, if you're using more than 500 tests, that the test itself is going to, the DHT from the test is going to mop the base SHBG. So your SHBG is always going to be hyperloaded or even crushed and taken out of the equation. So I don't know what the benefits of having it is, except for that it's a reservoir of gear. But if you're on enough gear, you don't need a reservoir of gear. Your muscles are a reservoir of gear. Right. Yeah. I mean, that was kind of my thought process too. I don't, I don't understand. I mean, if you're blasted off gear, it shouldn't matter. Right. I don't know what the value of it is. Now, my he's indicated that there is a complex that, in theory, that there is a test a bound SHBG molecule will bind to its own receptor. And I know that's true for like the prostate. When estrogen binds to SHBG, it can bind to the prostate, which then upregulates DHT receptors to make you vulnerable to prostate cancer. I don't know that there's a benefit to giving yourself prostate cancer. So therefore, I don't know what the benefit of having SHBG is, but what if, and this is, I think it's his hypothesis, is that there's a special undisclosed receptor, either on the surface of the cell or in the nucleus for the bound SHBG complex. And then there's an unknown pathway for anabolism from transcription or translation from this. So in other words, you could get more stimulation of muscle protein synthesis from a bound SHBG molecule binding somewhere on the hmm. muscle cell itself. I don't know if there's science to support this or if this is his hypothesis. I'd have to discuss it with him further. He was a medical student who um, start. I guess he, from what he said, Business took off, so he stopped focusing on school and focused on business. But he still applied his skills at learning to anabolics. So, I mean, this would be a very complicated subject to broach, is to figure out what are the anabolic utility of SHBG. But that's something that I'm not aware of. Yeah, I've had a lot of people reach out to me about bringing SHBG up. I had never heard of it being a thing to even be concerned about <clears throat> until recently. Somebody, somebody's talking about it. But I, I have to see. It, it's they, they, People keep referencing other people on the internet. There's people that are talking about bringing it up. Huh. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know who. I'll have to find out more. All right, man, that's all I got time for today. I really appreciate you coming on. Um, oh. how, can pe- how can people get a hold of you, Todd? All right, so you can go to... The Instagram is at Todd Lee MD, um, or you could do apexcoaching.com, myapexcoaching.com for coaching. Those are the two best ways to get a hold of me is through Instagram or through myapexcoaching.com. Probably, if you don't remember that, just Googling my name, Todd Lee MD or Todd Lee MD Bodybuilding will help you find me in some capacity. I've got... I'm on every social media platform, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, you name it. The YouTube channel is Apex Coaching. The website is My Apex Coaching. 
and then my name for the social media stuff. And I'll put all that in the contact information below. I, I think I also saw you're running a sale too, right? <laughs> on, on oh, yeah, Val, the Valhalla Labs is running a flash sale up through to the, today. It's 20% off. And I own the Valhalla Labs supplement company. I designed all the products. And I know that <laughs> I always <laughs> answer the question literally, like, how do they get a hold of you? This is how you hold me. I always forget that I'm supposed to remind <laughs> everyone that I own a supplement company and design the products, Valhalla Labs, and we have a sale going flash 20 for 20% off everything in the store. All right, dude. Well, I appreciate you coming on, man. Thank you. See you later, buddy. For coaching or consultations, head over to www.anabolicbodybuilding.com to book your spot today. I can help you with optimizing hormones, fat loss, muscle gain, physique, athletic performance, nutrition, and health. For more information, shoot me an email at bigp3rd at gmail.com.